Hello everyone, I'm Martin Graeber and uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Roy Palmer Lecture for 2020. This series of lectures, which is the fifth, was started in 2016 and the aim is to keep alive the memory of Roy who died in 2015. He was one of our foremost writers on folk song, folklore and social history as well as having made a significant collection of folk songs, which you can hear on the British Library's website. He was also a good friend to several of us and always willing to share his knowledge freely and to help in many different ways. It's in this spirit that we offer a platform to leading figures, the opportunity to share their knowledge and experience in an aspect of their work that they care deeply about. This year's lecture is once again being hosted by the Traditional Song Forum, though of necessity as an online event, and this does have both advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is that we don't have you, the audience, in the room with us, with the human contact that we'd all enjoy. There are, though, two big advantages. The first is that we've got the largest audience that we've ever had filling the Zoom event and spilling over into the YouTube live stream. About 170 people last time I counted. And the second is that it's made it possible to bring our speaker for today, Jeff Warner, to talk to us from his home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now, Jeff's a professional musician and educator with many years of experience, and he grew up with traditional song in a way that few others have done since his parents, Frank and Anne Warner, were folk song collectors. Starting in 1838, they met and recorded many singers in the wild places of eastern United States. And as I'm sure he'll tell you, Jeff travelled with them on some of their later expeditions and met several of those old musicians. In his own career, he's brought the songs sung to his parents to audiences in the USA in concerts and schoolrooms. And he's a regular visitor to Britain and his talk tonight is Old Songs for New Folk, Interpreting the Tradition for Lay Audiences. Before I ask him to start, I'll just explain a couple of things about the event. This is the first time we've used the Zoom webinar platform and we're grateful to Steve Rowley for setting this up for us. There are a few differences from the standard Zoom meeting. First off, you, we can't see you or hear you, so you don't have to worry about suppressing those irritating personal habits and you don't <laughs> need to put the dog out. If you're in the Zoom section of the event, you have both the normal chat facility and a list called Q&A. Now, pretty obviously the chat is for chatting, just the general greetings and so on. And Q&A is where you write your questions as we go along. If you're with us in the YouTube live stream, then you have only your own chat. Elaine's watching this, and if you write any questions there, she'll copy them across to the Zoom, Zoom Q&A. After Jeff has finished talking, we'll select some of the questions from those you've asked, and I'll either ask them on your behalf, or if you're on Zoom, bring you into the meeting temporarily. So, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I'm going to hand over to Jeff Warner to deliver the 2020 Roy Palmer Lecture. Over to you, Jeff. myself quite lucky to find myself alive. Hitched up my whole team, my business to pursue, and went to haul them coal as I used to do. Now the alehouse being open and the whiskey running free. As soon as I had one glass, another stood by me. Only hauled but one load instead of hauling four. 
and got so drunk in Shippen's Port that I couldn't haul no more. I took my saddle from the wall, staggered from the bar, saddled up my old gray mare, thinking it no harm, climbed upon her back and I rode away so still, I scarcely caught my breath till I came to Long Hill. My father fast pursued me, he rode both night and day. He must have had a pilot or else he'd have lost his way. I looked in every hole and corner where he saw the light till his old gray head was wet with the dews of the night. I have a bold companion whose name I will not tell. Invited me to go downtown with him to cut a swell. After much persuasion with him, I did agree. We went down to the tailor shop, the fiddler for the sea. Up stepped two young ladies, all ready for the dance. Up stepped two young gentlemen, all in advance. Fiddler being willing and his arm being strong, we danced the night in Laurel Hill, at least six hours long. I woke up one morning in 1845. I thought myself quite lucky to find myself alive. He stuck my whole team, my business to pursue, and went to hauling coal as I used for the do. So what the devil is going on in that song? I mean, it's so intriguing. It, a guy gets up and he goes to work, but he decides to go to the tavern instead, and he gets drunk, and then he goes to a dance. And yet, and yet, that song has been incredibly popular throughout American tradition. It seems to start in the 1840s in Vermont, the uh, state just to the west of me here in New Hampshire, in the north, in New England, and then. This version that I did was an Indiana version of it, and it, it was much, much later that I found out that this song uh, was also sung by Frank Prophet, who was a, an informant of my parents, Ann and Frank Warner, who also loved the song. And it's just as mysterious all the time. So it's kind of my way of getting into how we convey this music that we love I assume everybody here is a singer of old songs or a, a, a fan of old songs and has found him or herself in a situation where they're asked to share. Sometimes we are professionals, sometimes we're just singing at sing around, sometimes we sing to our kids, but all of us here are amateur folklorists and have a real interest in it. Um, how do we how do we convey those kinds of songs that we love best to people who aren't used to hearing them at all? Um, and that's what I'm going to try to get at today a little bit. A song like that has mystery to it, and very often one of the great things about old songs is the feeling of ancientness, or the feeling of otherness, or the feeling of far away, and the feeling kind of like human truth. I uh, came across recently this nice quote from your own John Kirkpatrick, the great performer, band leader, songwriter, and traditional artist. He said, traditional music, which is sort of what we call us, I and mean, what do you call folk songs? It, it's traditional music, traditional, uh, traditional song, Traditional music isn't cool and sophisticated. It isn't easy listening. It isn't quiet and introspective. 
It's simple and straightforward. It's full of life and lust. It's dark and dangerous. It's exotic and mysterious. It addresses the uncivilized part of human nature. It deals with epic themes in a way we can cope with. It channels our excess energy. It makes us feel we belong somewhere. I said, yeah, if we can do that in sharing these songs, we have done our job. Now, as Martin in his fine introduction uh, indicated, I have a, a special, uh, special pedigree in that I came from a family that collected old-time songs. And I'm really glad that I followed in the, I won't call it a trade, my father was a semi-professional singer. Mostly he was a YMCA executive. But he was from the South. He, uh, he always played with black kids. He knew old songs, both black and white culture. He was a singer of the top line at a uh, glee club at Duke University in the 20s that he led and toured around the state. So Dr. Frank C. Brown, who was teaching uh, folklore at Duke University at the time in the 1920s, asked my father to uh, illustrate some of the ballads that he had collected in his classes. I don't often get to do this, so I thought I would let you hear my father sing part of an old uh, ballad, Sweet Willie, and I'll let Martin do that for me. It's number 11 of the ones we worked on, Martin, Frank Warner. Since I can't hear that, I'll assume you can't hear that, and so I'll carry on. Hang on. Sorry. We've got to unmute him. <laughs> From upon his milk white steed, and she on her dappled gray, he flang his bugle horn around his neck, and they went a riding away. It had not gone more than a mile and a half until they both looked back and to see her father and seven of her brothers come a tripling over the track. Oh, get right down, sweet Willie Cry, and hold my milk quite steep. While I fight your father and seven of your brothers, I'll go dying in my own heart. Blood. Thank you, Martin. That's I'll great. Fight down without. I'm having such a good time. I'd like to just sit and listen to him sing that. It's an Earl Brand version of Earl Brand that he got from, was collected in North Carolina by Frank C. Brown and learned by my father. And he carried it with him all his life. So he had an interest in that when he, when he, when they, my parents first saw a mountain dulcimer, and no one in New York had it seen it in the 1930s, he wrote to Nathan Hicks uh, on Western in, in Beach Mountain in Western North Carolina. And when the dulcimer was ready that my father had ordered, my folks decided to go down there and meet the family and hear some of the music that they did. I have a picture right here that I'll show you, which is of Nathan Hicks and his wife, Rena, and the youngest of their 13 children, Nell was her name, in western North Carolina looking into Tennessee there in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, living, as a friend of mine once said, not much differently than the first Scots-Irish settlers did when they went into the Appalachians in the 1760s and 70s. One of the people that they met on that trip was uh, Nathan's son-in-law, who is Frank Prophet. This is a picture of, i got to get it out of my light. This is a picture of uh, Frank Prophet of Reese, North Carolina. It's a picture taken in 1951. You can see the big tape recorder, the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And Frank was playing a homemade banjo that he made. He learned from his father how to make banjos. And in his last year of life in 1965, Frank made one for me when I was at college, and I brought it with me. 
because I couldn't pass up the opportunity to have everybody who's so far away. I can never bring this to England when I come, so it's nice to have it this way anyway. Frank uh, had amazing repertoire, and my, he, he, my father uh, worked with him more and more to remember the old songs that he had learned from his Aunt Nancy brother. Then one of the songs that he learned was the, the Ballad of Tom Dooley, which my father said, now there's a great song, learned as best he could and sang it for years. And eventually it got picked up by You Know Who, the Kingston Trio in uh, San Francisco, and made it to a giant hit in 1958 that sold three million copies. But the source of that was Frank Prophet. His tune was not the way that it ended up in my father's voice or in the Kingston Trio. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of the way that Frank Prophet sang that song to my father in 1938 and play it on a fretless homemade banjo that Frank learned how to make from his own father. Hang down, you hit Tom Dooley, hang down, you hit and cry. Kill little Laurie Foster and now you're bound to die. This time tomorrow, I reckon where I'll be. For grace, and I'd have been in Tennessee. Of course, the tune that most of you remember was Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley. Hang down your head and cry. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Poor boy, you're bound to die. The Franks went. Hand it down. Hang down your head, Tom Dooley. Hang down your head and cry. Laurie Foster, now you're bound to die. Frank Prophet's old time handmade banjo. I'm sure you got a lot of questions. Ask them later. Um, what it brings up is a very interesting question to me that when when you are performing traditional songs what what responsibility do we have as singers for people who aren't used to hearing this kind of music to be true to the style in which the songs were sung um, I don't think I mean my father there was singing in a style that he heard on a recording from Frank Brown in the 1920s but he went on to meet these people who sang great old songs to him, and he felt it was his job to try to convey to audiences in the North and in the West and around America um, the way these people sang the songs. So it wasn't just the text or the melody. And that has been, that stayed with me a lot um, in listening to traditional singers. The way they sing songs is pretty important. Let's, let's listen to a couple. I, I just, Let's let's hear Bob Copper. I mean, Bob Copper, you know, from Sussex, your own great song collector, uh, has just a natural way of singing. So let's hear him little, do a little bit. Come, old jolly fellows, that delight in being mellow, attend unto me, I beseech you. For a pint when it's quiet, come boys, let us try it. For dull thinking will drive a man crazy. I have lawns, I have bowers, I have fruits, I have flowers, and the lark is my morning alarm. So jolly boys now, here's God speed the plow, so long life and success to the farmer. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Bob Copper, I mean, you can just you can just practically feel like you're in the room with him. And you do get this song the feeling that the song is the important thing and not the singer. It's not Wow, listen to me, I'm going to sing this great song. It is, here is a song 
from tradition. My tradition or another tradition has value in and of itself in what it conveys. That's a very important thing to me. Let's, I want to show you another picture here. This is one of my favorite singers out of my parents' uh, people that they met. This is a picture taken in the 1940s of a traditional singer in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains. He was a logger, uh, a lumberjack, if you will, who spent his whole life cutting down trees and working with that. And this is me when I was three years old and got a first chance to hear him. Now I've studied his singing pretty well. Once again, he was a great storyteller and knower of old songs. So I'd like for you to hear his voice in an old ballad from New England. Some say it's the earliest ballad recorded, ever uh, written down from New England, Springfield Mountain. Oh, you need a number on that, don't you? Um, did I even... Sorry, I don't think you gave me that one. No, I didn't, so I'll just sing it for you. <laughs> on Springfield Mountain there did dwell A likely youth I knowed full well Lieutenant Cushman's his only son a like like you, scarce twenty-one. One Monday's morning he did go out in the meadow for to mow. He scarce had mowed quite around the field when a cruel serpent took his heel. Long story, not only long story there in the ballad, but a long story of what happened to that song. Maybe we'll have a chance to get to it. But to hear his voice and the way he sang uh, let's do number one with uh, John Galusha's version of the Days of 49. I'm old Tom Moore from the Bummer Shore in the good old golden days. They call me a bummer in a gin sap day. They call me a bummer in a gin sap too. But I don't care for praise. I wander around from town to town, just like a roving sign. The people all say there goes Tom Moore of the days of 49. In the days of old, the days of gold, how all times I repine. For the days of old, and we dug up the gold in the days of 49. Thank you, Martin. That's great. Nice to revisit uh, John Galusha. He was uh, in his 80s there, and um, probably not as fine a singer as he was in his youth when he was renowned. But the truth of the matter is there, it was the song that was more important than the singer. So the importance of style, I think we all have to consider it. For 20 plus years, I had a music partner a fine banjo player and fiddler named Jeff Davis. And we traveled together all over the place and did a billion school programs together. And we had great debates often about how best to approach tradition and style. His, uh, his thinking was, you find a singer that you truly, truly love and you emulate him. You get note for note so you understand how he approaches a song. And my feeling always was, listen a lot to traditional singers, gather the 42 things that they tend to do, and then use them. So you're not trying to be uh, a cowboy singer, you're not trying to be an Appalachian singer. You're singing songs the way that old timers sang songs to get them across to other people. The first time I ever, I mean, style was not something people thought about uh, until maybe the 1950s. The first mention I ever heard of it was from Charles Seeger, Pete Seeger's father, who was uh, an, actually a musicologist and a teacher of atonal theory. And, but he was called upon by the Farm Security Administration and the Roosevelt Administration in the 1930s to try to use folk music to help uh, disadvantaged communities in the Midwest that had been hit by the Dust, dust Bowl. And I remember what he wrote once. He said, you know, when somebody 
sings a song, a folk song in an urban setting, the people where the song came from should at least have a chance to recognize the song. I thought, oh yeah, that's really the first time anybody said that not only melody and words are important in the song, but the way of delivering it. Um, and that leads me to the Harry Smith Anthology of 1952, which came out. Uh, Harry Smith was a kind of a strange, wonderful guy. He was a collector of uh, 78s from, of country music, early country music in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s. And in 1952, he came out with a six LP album of some 85 of these songs that came out of American early commercial country music. And it really was then non-commercial. It was people who, were, who had day jobs in rural America who also sang and wanted to cash in on some of the recordings and touring shows that were going on. Harry Smith had an amazing effect uh, on urban America. I, there's a recent article in the New York Times where it said Harry Smith dropped an extraordinary rural working class culture bomb on New York City world of artists, bohemians, radicals, city musicians, melding urban with rural, old forms with new, northerners with southerners, immigrants with natives. Smith's vision of America could transcend such binaries, making beatniks go for the music of coal miners, hippies dig the psychedelic sound of the banjo, and good old boys from the south, smitten for Mississippi John Hurt's finger-picking prowess. Well, I'll tell you who got caught up by that Harry Smith anthology, and that was the New Lost City Ramblers, who formed in 1958. They tried very hard to copy the sound of first the people that they heard on these recordings, and then later on going back to find these people now in their 70s and 80s who had made these recordings and emulate their style and bring those people into the public, the Newport Folk Festival and the like. Um, and it, it is, it's, it's interesting to me that when they first started performing in 1958, uh, that the folklore world, the academic folklore world kind of pounced on them and said, this is terrible, you're mimicking and you shouldn't mimic. The feeling was leave rural people with their music and their songs. Don't try to copy it as such. Eh, I don't know. So it, it, but they changed the world, the Ramblers, and they, they made it lovely to hear old time fiddle tunes in a scratchy way and to hear the old time jokes and to hear the old time songs. Ruth Crawford Seeger, uh, who was Charles Seeger's wife, and Mike Seeger, who's the New Lost City Ramblers, Mike Seeger's mother, uh, was an atonal composer. But she also lived in Chicago, and she became friends um, with various people who were involved in folk song, and went off to study under Charles Seeger at Berkeley in atonal music. But the folk song was part of his life, too, and because of her connection to Charles, she got asked by the Seegers, John, uh, by the uh, Lomaxes, John and Alan Lomax, to do an introduction to one of their books that they published in 1941. Let's see, Our Singing Country, John and Alan Lomax. And I've heard the story that she, uh, she wanted to write an introduction about the music that she was notating and about the singers from whom she'd learned them. And she was so earnest in doing that that she delayed the publication of the book by a few months. But she came out with suggestions on how people who read this book can sing these kinds of songs in the way that they were sung in rural settings. And among the 16 different suggestions she has were do not sing with expression, or make an effort to dramatize. 
maintain a level of more or less the same degree of loudness or softness from beginning to the end of the song. It's not the singer in these cases, it's the song. So you step back. Do not slow down at the ends of phrases or stanzas of songs. Frequent stereotype rotondos are rarely heard in the singing of these songs. Uh, I agree. I, I, I find, find I rarely, rarely slow down at the end of the song, which is very kind of artful, and it's not my favorite. Do not let the presence of extra syllables in succeeding stanzas deter you from singing a thong, song through. Most singers crowd them, but not too hurriedly, into the established measure length. Others insert extra beats to care for them in a more leisurely fashion. On Springfield Mountain there did dwell a likely youth I knowed full well. Lieutenant Cushman's his only son, a likely youth scarce twenty-one. Go ahead and give me a beat to that. <laughs> well, you really can't give me a beat to that because the song is the text first. You get the text out, you get the words out as you would speak them, and then let the melody form around it. He scarce had mowed quite around the field, and a cruel serpent took his heel. He scarce had... You get the idea. Do not hesitate to sing without accompaniment. I think uh, in the 20th century, we always think of folk songs as having a banjo or a guitar or an auto harp or a dulcimer or some kind of instrument. And I often, that's what audiences expect, and I find I, like a lot of my peers who are in uh, professionally folk singing, will always do that, use instruments to do it. But there's such room for the unaccompanied song. And as she says, do not sing down to the songs. Theirs are old traditions dignified by hundreds of thousands of singers over long periods of time. Well, I want you to hear uh, one of my favorite singers, speaking of a direct way of singing. He's Horton Barker, uh, recorded in the 1950s, an Appalachian singer from Virginia. And his song is Sweet Mary, which is number nine. Please, Martin. Before I should talk to your father, sweet Mary says I. Don't talk to my father, says Mary, beginning to cry. My father, he loves me so dearly, he'll never consent I should go. If you talk to my father, says Mary, he'll sure to say no. Then suppose I should talk to your mother, sweet Mary, says I. Don't talk to my mother, says Mary, beginning to cry. My mother says men are deceiving, at least you repent. Then how shall I get you my jewel, sweet Mary, says I. Since your parents are both so contrary, most surely I'll die. Oh, never say die, dear, says Mary. A way now to save you I see. Since my parents are both so contrary, you'd better ask me. Charming song, charming singer. He's got a good voice. There's no question about that. And I'm sure he's proud of it. But you can feel it. It's the song first and the singer second. Uh, Almeda Riddle, the Arkansas singer, had this great phrase that she said, is get behind the song. Let the song be foremost. Uh, Ruth Crawford Seeger, another, in another one of her writings, said that what she observed from traditional singers it was when somebody sang a song in a room, instead of everybody clapping and saying, oh, that you have such a beautiful voice, 
they would say, that's a great song. And I, I feel that way. I'm in, I, here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, we've had a, a sing-around every Friday night. We had it for about 40 years. Huh? I came in late to the scene. But, you know, it's, it's like modern audiences, like at folk clubs everywhere around. Somebody sings a song and you all applaud for them. I'm not big on that. No, I just like that. That's a great song. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for singing it. So Almeida Riddle, the great Arkansas singer, with that phrase, get behind the song, let's hear her get behind a bit of this Texas Rangers. That's number six. Please, Martin. Come all you Texas Rangers, wherever you may be, I tell to you a story that happened unto me. And my name's nothing extra, so it I will not tell. But here's to all good rangers, I'm sure I wish you well. It was at the age of 20, I joined the ranger band. We marched from San Antonio down to the Rio Grande. Was here our captain told us, perhaps he thought it right. Before you reach the station, boys, I'm sure you'll have to fight. And when the bugle sounded and our captain gave command, to arms, to arms, he shouted, and by your horses stand. I saw the smoke ascending, and it seemed to reach the sky. The first thought then that struck me, my time has come to die. I Thank you, Martin. Thank you. I hate cutting her off. You go listen to her, Almeida Riddle. But wow, you know, power in there. But I don't get the feeling that she's boasting with that voice. It's lay the song out, let people hear it. And I think all of us who sing traditional songs and go around um, espousing them have that kind of responsibility of taking, taking the song and laying it out first. And you know, I've found for myself in performing for many years, it kind of takes the burden off me to be a great singer or an artist. I'm conveying, I am presenting in as, as pleasing and historically correct way as I can. Uh, I had an interesting, about three, four years ago, I was at a weekend given by the uh, Youth Traditional Song Organization there in New England and they have a, a weekend in February where uh, if you're over 50, you have to join a lottery to try to get into it because it's young people interested in singing together and doing old songs. And we all gathered, maybe 150 of us, <clears throat> that weekend. And the first meeting that we all had was on an issue that seemed to be burning that I hadn't thought about much myself. And it was what they called cultural appropriation. So you had all these middle-class kids from New England saying, in essence, look, I've got a, a degree in physics from MIT. What right do I have to sing a black Texas prison song? And it's a good question. And we debated it long, and I was very surprised that people were upset with the idea of, of singing songs that wasn't out of their own culture. The trouble for us in urban Britain, urban America, and suburban especially, is that we don't have our own traditional song. We don't have our own traditions that have come down to us. And we get very drawn to these rural traditions from the old times that were preserved because they were in isolated parts of the country or caught in books or in early recordings by song folklorists. So um, 
I, one of my uh, fellow staff members that weekend, a woman of about my age, her reaction was, when I was learning these songs, if I heard a song that I liked, I just sang it. And she said, said it in a much more colorful language than I just did. But I think I come down on that side, too. Uh, yes, because like with te Texas prison songs, with a lot of early black blues, if you don't sing them, nobody's going to sing them because black folks have gone on to the other kinds of music. They've incorporated those old styles into their new music. For us, if we love those kinds of songs, whether they're sea shanties or work songs or old ballads, uh, nobody else is going to sing them that way. So we have a responsibility to bring them out and offer them to people. But we also have the responsibility to be true to our sources, to learn from their singing styles, to learn about those singers, and to honor them and credit them with having preserved these songs and given them to us. So I have, uh, I mean, I started early on in my college. I was wanted to be Dave Von Rock, and I wanted to learn all these blues licks and stuff. And I became more and more interested in the white singers out of New England and the South that my folks had met. But I always had uh, black songs in my in my repertoire, and I don't I don't feel uncomfortable doing it any more than I feel uncomfortable singing a song from a woman's point of view. So you know, I'm, it's the song first, the singer second. So I'm perfectly happy singing a song from a woman's point of view. But black songs, yeah. I don't think you have to try to sound black. You just have to have the sound in your ear. So let me do a little bit of some. This is from, called the West Palm Beach Disaster. It's about a 1928 hurricane. Came out of the uh, black tradition in Florida. And I'll sing you what I learned. On 16th day of September in 1928, God started riding early, and he rode till mighty late in that storm. Oh, in that storm, Lord, somebody got drowned in that storm. He rode out on the ocean, chained lightning to his wheel. Stepped on land at West Palm Beach, and the wicked hearts did yield in that storm. Oh, in that storm, Lord, somebody got drowned in that storm. Over in Okeechobee, all scattered on the ground, and the last report of dead they had was 2,200 drowned in that storm. Oh, in that storm, Lord, somebody got drowned in that storm. And on. So there's definitely black left in there, but I'm not trying to copy it straight out. In this forum, uh, the last regular meeting that they had, Brian Peters did a, a beautiful paper on uh, A.L. Lloyd and his tendency back in the 1950s and 60s to change traditional songs without giving credit to himself, to find different tunes that he thought were more appropriate to the texts. I think that's perfectly fine. But also to rewrite folk songs or to even write them sometimes and credit them as traditional. And as Brian was saying, in an attempt to make um, to make dalliance lusty and natural rather than dangerous, or wrote even write write tunes that he thought were more traditional. Now, I wouldn't go that far, but I think we all have the right to, uh, to which how shall I put it, that traditional texts are not the holy word. You don't have to do every single word the way a traditional singer did. You can change it a little bit to make it your, your own. I see no trouble with that. And I also know that traditional singers did it all the time. I know Almeida Riddle did it, putting her own verses in to bring it to her own world. Um, an example from Burt Lloyd that I have. I start to sing this song. 
that I learned from a text in the 1840s of a whaler. And it says, The Mary Jane of Sunderland is under our lee. She is trying for to weather us, but that can never be. The captain's on the quarter deck crying steady as she goes. When the man from on the lookout sings out there, she blows. Be cheerful, my lads, let your hearts never fail. While the bold harpooner is a striking of the whale. Now, whenever I do that, of course, people start singing, but they sing, um, they just tend to sing the. Uh, where am I? My mind's going here. Uh, the Bonnie Ship, the Diamond, which, as far as I can tell, was an A.L. Lloyd text when he wrote that song. That's what everybody knows now that's been accepted into the folk revival. But this, this is the way it was sung. At first, I was uncomfortable singing a version of the song that none of my audience could sing along with at first. And then I found this version of the song in Moby Dick. I said, after that, I don't care what the other, what other people sing. Then lower away your boats, my boys, and after him we'll go. For we know that he's a sperm whale because he's felt so low. We pulled up alongside and we hove two irons in. But the whale, he hit us with his flukes and killed one of our men. But be cheerful, lads, let your hearts never fail. While the bold harpooner is a striking of the whale, be cheerful, lads, let your hearts never fail. While the bold harpooner is a striking of the whale. I think one of the, the things that I do, I, I've had a chance to work a lot with kids in schools. And I found, as a matter of fact, if I wanted to make a living doing uh, old-time music and traditional music, that I'd better learn how to work with kids in schools. And I have. But I, I have picked up so many wonderful things from the kids, um, because one of the things I'll try to do is to, uh, to try to introduce tradition to kids, is I'll say, what songs do you have? Or uh, what rhymes do you have? And I'll get all kinds of jump rope rhymes from girls saying, um, Sally's having a baby. Her boyfriend's going crazy. How many babies did she have? One, two, three, four, five. This is great folklore. And it, it you can use, when you're talking to adult audiences, you can use things that happen with kids. It's great fun. Um, if I can give you another example. I was once at a, uh, at a festival in Los Angeles where uh, one of the seminars was on people who work with children in, in schools. And uh, one, of the, one of the panelists there had the greatest job in the world. She was a Girl Scout leader, girl guy, Girl Scout leader, whose job it was to teach song leaders songs to teach to Girl Scouts all around the country. I thought, but that's the greatest job ever. And she sang a song, I don't know, maybe it came from the TV show Barney. It said, uh, if all of the raindrops were lemon drops and gum drops, oh, what a rain it would be. If all of the raindrops were lemon drops and gum drops, oh, what a rain it would be. We would stand outside with our mouths open wide, going ah, 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 If all of the raindrops were lemon drops and gum drops, oh, what a rain it would be. And there were lots of verses if all the snowflakes were lemon drops. And, but she said what, she, what made her love the song was that a girls at, at a camp in Southern California had written a verse which said, if all of the flies was great looking guys, whoa, what a camp this would be. We would stand outside with our arms open wide, going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if 
fall of the flies was great looking guys. Whoa, what a camp this would be. So if you have a chance to sing with kids, ask them what they sing, ask them what their rhymes are, and use them. I use them all the time when I'm presenting traditional music to people who aren't used to hearing these old songs. Uh, put them in touch with their own childhood or put them in touch with kids today. It's a very winning way to go about it. I'd also say keep a journal. You know, if you're involved in presenting these old songs to people, keep a journal of good quotes that you find. I, I remember uh, Daniel Borstein was a librarian of Congress some years ago here in, in Washington, D.C. And he, he said, trying to plan for the future without a sense of the past is like trying to plant cut flowers. Now that is pith. I wrote it down. And David McCullough, the uh, American historian, said history is an antidote to the hubris of the present. Enough said. I also wrote down once in my journal this uh, quote from Jean Ritchie, the great Kentucky singer, who uh, in her singing family of the Cumberlands was talking about the singing of wondrous love and what it did for her when she heard it in her community. As we sang it, it seemed that thousands of people in a thousand years sang with us the simple words that we that know no time, that never fail to make me chill and tremble to my heart. I think if we keep that feeling that we all have about these old songs, when we convey them to audiences on both sides of the Atlantic, it makes a great deal of difference. And I always love this quote that I, that I got from Uncle Dave Macon, who was an early country music artist and one of the first stars of the Grand Old Opry, who said, uh, people, when Columbus discovered this country, it was plumb full of nuts and berries. But I'm here to tell you, them berries is just about all gone. And another quote that I loved was from Liza Carthy in the UK, who said of traditional songs, it's like your ancestor whispering in your ear, telling you what went on and how they felt about it. You can find that in a traditional song. It's as if you can ask them yourself. Well, let's listen to another couple of traditional singers, perhaps. Um, I mean, just unbridled, great singing it's coming from the heart and soul is my hero, Louis Killen, a uh, singer from the northeast of England. And he taught me how to play concertina. I learned from him about sea music and about ballad singing. Uh, a great singer, but I always felt that the song came first. Let's hear a little bit of him, number eight, please, singing Wild Goose. I would be a wild goose, sailing on the ocean. Run low, run low, way. They're just like them pretty girls when they get to the ocean. Run low, run low, way. Walking by the river, Ranzo, Ranzo, when I saw a young girl walking with her topsails all up to river, Ranzo, Ranzo, thank you, Martin. Boy, I mean, just hearing it again now. Look, look at the way he takes the phrases. The words are so important. There's no beat. He just sings the words uh, and keeps it going until he gets through the line. That's a very good lesson for us all to learn. Back to the concept of cultural appropriation. Uh, a couple of things come up all the time, and that is 
minstrel shows. Um, they're vile to us. This is what happened in America in the 1840s with a s black music from the South coming up to urban centers in the North in America uh, through bands like the Virginia Minstrels, the Dan Emmett, uh, and Joel Sweeney had learned how to play banjo and learned songs from black singers, and they came, formed the Virginia Minstrels, and came to New York in 1843. And it took the world by storm. People loved this music. And we have to recognize that. We don't do minstrel songs. We loathe blackface. We don't try to mimic black singers. But the songs that happened, that came out of minstrelsy, were America's first pop music. And it showed the blend of white and black culture in America, which in fact is still with us today and became not only America's pop music today, but a world music. Uh, it's just so vital. You can't, not only that, there's so many minstrel songs which came down to us as our folk songs. We don't even think about them as being out of blackface uh, tradition. I'll give you one. I, I sang this song, I finally broke down and learned this song because I was working with kids, but, um, and kids all knew it. But when I sang it for fun once at an English folk song club, everybody sang it with me. I said, oh, you know this song too? It's American minstrel, Polly Wally Doodle all the day, right? You don't think of it as being vile, it's just part of American culture. So let's do a little bit of it. Went downtown to see my Sal, Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Sal, she is a sassy gal, Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Fare thee well, fare thee well, fare thee well, my fairy fae. I'm going to Louisiana for to see my Susie Anna singing Polly Wally Doodle all the day. I love watermelon and I have for years. Polly Wally Doodle all the day. When I eat it up, it gets in my ears. Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Fare thee well, fare thee well, fare thee well, my fairy fay. I'm going to Louisiana for to see my Susie Anna singing Polly Wally Doodle all the day. Now you can't just throw that song out the second story window. It is American culture and it is British culture. And by using songs that everybody knows that have come down to us, uh, you have a way of then introducing to uh, lay audiences more difficult songs, uh, Almeida Riddle kinds of things, or uh, John Galusha kinds of songs. So just understand that we have, to, we have to take our history, we can't just reject it. We have to know what happened. And minstrelsy is how banjos got into Americana, moving from a totally black African-American instrument in the 1700s to an almost totally white American instrument in bluegrass music. Amazing stuff. Richard Schultz is a friend of mine in Bellingham, Washington, and talking about how you get people interested in songs. He, uh, he knows a great number of old songs, but he's worked with uh, old people's homes a lot, and he had a way of getting to them right away by saying, what's a song that everybody knows? And people would say, oh, everybody knows this, and they would sing it. And he could find old songs that way that people, everybody knew, introduced them, and then he could do other songs that he wanted to do. Maybe one other thing that I'll, I'll talk about, because though it's a long subject and we haven't got any more time, and that's religious song. When I first started singing American gospel songs in England, I found great resistance to them, and people said to me, oh, that's for church, that's not for the folk club. And it took me a long time to realize that there was a kind of a difference of the way songs had been collected in America and in Britain, and a difference in the folk song revival, in that you can't avoid gospel spiritual songs in American tradition. You just lose half of the material that, come out, that comes out of tradition. But in England, the folk song revival, uh, led by Bert Lloyd and 
and Ewan McCall, I think, was a more political one, perhaps, uh, and that the church in England was the state. And if you were rebelling against the state and the ideas uh, and trying to bring up the working class, you didn't want the church-state idea being there. So I've worked with it. I've, I've done a lot of uh, gospel workshops because it's the song and not the message. Right? It's the singing together that's the most important thing. So yeah, I think it's changed over the past 20 years in England, the attitude toward traditional music, partly from West Gallery music, partly from the uh, gospel songs that the Watersons have recorded. So I say, don't just let it go. And maybe uh, one other quote from my journal before we end this. Uh, was William James, the late 19th century American philosopher and the brother of Henry James, who said, as my brother reminded me, I don't sing because I'm happy. I'm happy because I sing. Keep singing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was uh, very thoughtful. A few things to think about there. Um, we've got a few questions. Um, many of them from the YouTube side of the world, um, but if there are any more questions that come up on this side, please add them to the Q&A. So uh, Liz Milner was asking, um, could you tell her the source of the John Kirkpatrick quote? you used early on no <laughs> no and you know i mean i'm pretty good usually about writing down sources but i i that one probably didn't quote the source when i wrote it down or i would have written it down so i don't remember somebody was quoting him and they failed to, to cite it. it's a good quote though okay. i can read it again if you want to yeah well, then. Or, or actually you can write me via my website uh, jeffwarner.com jeff with a j and i'll try to give you whatever i'm talking about here today sources perfect okay good advice right to jeff um i guess that also goes to andy's question any chance of the kirkpatrick source stroke text so you know what to do andy um We've had a couple of people asking, will this video be up after today? And may we invite other people to view it? Well, the first thing we need to establish with that is when he's had a look at it, will Jeff be happy with it? Um, I think he should be. Um, if that is the case, that will be going up on YouTube. We will put up the version that we get off Zoom rather than the version that we get off YouTube itself. Um, and it won't be going up on the YouTube channel that uh, you're currently viewing out on um, because that was a temporary channel that we've set up for these two meetings. We'll be moving the overflow from future meetings onto our current YouTube channel, which is just called Traditional Song Forum rather than Traditional Song Forum Online, which is what people are watching on at the moment. So those of you who've signed up to the Traditional Song Forum online, sorry, it won't be there in a week's time. Um, but the video will eventually be going up on um, the other YouTube channel and uh, you can find it there. Um, and uh, the plan is that we will be putting up videos of our meetings there in the future where the participants agree to it. So um, then, question from Tim Radford, would you? Um, what would you say is the biggest difference between English singing and American singing? Because I know regionalism will make differences, but can you think of a main difference between English and American? I don't have that at the top of my head. I could probably try to talk about it, but I, I don't. I, I don't feel no. The, the 
I'm much more interested in the fact that you listen to your traditional singers and emulate the way they present the songs. You can start with Louis Killen, but any any of the recorded traditional singers, Bob Copper too, and the singers that he's recorded. So I don't. I don't really know the differences. I'd let somebody who's a more astute in style gather that together. I'm just, from my point of view, listen to the traditional singers and then use what you've what you got imbued in you from those singers and projecting the songs out to lay audiences. Okay. Um. I will say that I found a lot of English traditional tunes tend to be more complex and beautiful than a lot of the American tunes. There's beauty in American tunes, but it's oftentimes it's incredibly simple, incredibly uh, not so with the old modal banjo tunes and all, they're great, but there's just the, the range of English melodies tends to be greater than what we brought over from you. Um, our ability to give instant answers because of the vast uh, hive brain we've got out there means that the John Kirkpatrick quote is now on the chat. So uh, those people who are asking, you can find it there. I'm delighted to say. Super. Um, Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll send you the chat. Um, Vincent Cross is asking, could you say how interpretation of the tradition extends into songwriting? I, I, I don't, I've never written a song. And it's, it's not a particular interest to me. I have found my calling in representing old singers. But I, it's, I mean, look at Bob Dylan, you know? <laughs> He, he just listened and listened and listened to traditional singers and traditional songs, and it became it came out of him so much a part of it. There's that style of, that he has. So I think the answer is go ahead and write songs that you're right, and it's beautiful, and you should, but uh, use a lot of the styles that you hear, the phrasing that you hear. Use words first rather than melody first. Use um, timing. Don't be locked in. I know you're going to have to play your guitar, or play your banjo, uh, but put extra beats in if you want to. Use extra phrases. I the song I learned from a logger in uh, in the Catskill Mountains. Just <laughs> roving journeyman or a roving peddler. I'll do a little bit of it just so you can see how the phrasing does what it wants to do. I am a roving peddler and I've roamed this country round till it took a notion to view some other crown with my pack upon my shoulder and my cudgel in my hand I went into New Hampshire to view that happy land I went into New Hampshire and the girls all jumped for joy and one said to another, there's that handsome peddler boy. They invited me to dine with them, they took me by the hand. And the toast they did fly merrily, success to the peddler man. So even though I put an instrument to that song, I tried to keep the way he sang it using the phrasing first. So when you write a song, think about the way traditional singers sing the song, see if you can put part of that into your writing. Good luck. Unmute myself. Uh, could you uh, give us the title of the song that you started with? Oh, yes. blanking because 1845 
I call it 1845 because that's what I heard it. In the Vermont collection, I think it's called the Woodhaller Song. I believe that's what its, its generic name is, the Woodhaller Song. But I know it is 1845. Okay. Thank you. Um, John Baxter's asking, when you spoke about the new city ramblers, it made me think that the important responsibility of the older generation is not to tell the youngsters they're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's right. It's the new lost city ramblers. And a weird title that probably uh, that they came up with. Uh, it, it's, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's, times are going to change. There was the Indi Indiana University, the folklore department in the United States, coming down heavily on them for mimicking traditional scientists. So let them have it themselves. But no, they wanted to. They wanted to replicate that sound, and they honored it. And I think that's what we have to do. You can't mimic. You have to honor and just try to replicate it as best you can. So yes, I agree with that. Yeah, the final part of his answer arrived later and says, does this chime with you? So I guess it does. Um, Benedict Galliardi is saying, can you share any experiences with folks who had differing opinions about making changes, additions, adaptations, reinterpretations to songs for whatever reason? No, I think it's a, hi, hi Ben, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a careful thing. I think you can only come to it after listening to a lot of traditional songs. But I, I don't, I think a lot of people, especially maybe in the 60s and 70s, who were following folk songs, were very careful never to change any of the text that was there. And my only point was, go ahead, and if you feel a verse in the style in which you're learning the song is valid, go ahead and do it. Um, you don't you don't have to be like the folk Nazi idea of whatever text came out of tradition is holy and has to be has to be replicated. I just I think you have well, traditional singers change things as they wanted to change things as they forgot. They put their own lives into them. So that's all I say. I don't have specific moments where I was confronted or anything. I just, uh, over the years, I have evolved to the place where I say, if I want to add another verse to that, I'll do so. Okay. Thank you, Benedict. Very interesting question from Steve Woodbury. Um, and I guess he's talking about American song collections. He says many of the songs printed in collections like Brown, McGill and others have quite consistent time signatures. Did the collectors square it off? John Roberts, I know, he's an Englishman, been over here for 40 years singing great English and American songs, did a nice treatise on this. Maybe you can write to him and find out what it was about how you, uh, the time signatures, most, most people didn't know how to handle it. Ruth Crawford Seeger did the best she could uh, by saying, here's, here's the way I, I can put it into music, but sing it freely. Don't be bound by the beat. If you've got words to sing, let it go through beyond the beat. Take a breath where you want to. Don't feel you have to dance the music according to the time signature. So yeah, I think as people collected these songs before the 1950s and 60s when there's a sense of, oh my goodness, we've got to make some co correction in this music because you can't just sing it in this even way. But before that, they just used whatever musicology they had, listening to the melody, putting it into timed signatures as best they could, and maybe writing freely over the top. But traditional singers, who often didn't have instruments and weren't worried about dance beats, just sang the way the story came out. Think of Bob Copper singing that we heard together. Right. Thank you. In other words, ignore those time signatures. Uh, I'll just quote Baring Gould on this, where he said yes. he found it almost impossible to put traditional singers into the framework of a time signature. Uh, Thank you. Um, 
Okay. Uh, Conrad Blady is asking, do you think there is an adequate frame of reference in the public to do more than entertain? No. I think if I understand the question, I think no. People, you know, people just want to have a good time. So it's our job. That's why I use kids jokes and songs that people have a chance of recognizing. Um, I find it very important, even if I'm tired of a song. Um, oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. I come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. That can light a crowd up right away because, oh, there's something that they have, something they understand that's part of them. And you can use that as an avenue for bringing in something that's really strange and wonderful and beautiful. So no, people just want to have a good time. You know, and it's our job, um, as Michael Cooney used to say, give them what they need, not what they want. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've covered that. So, um, no more questions have come in, which isn't bad because we're up to nearly 20 past. I guess I was complete. <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much. That was absolutely lovely. Um, and I think we would have been very happy with what you've talked about. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Steve Rowley, who's given his all over the last few weeks, trying to sort me out with all this stuff. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. And it's not, it's definitely not his fault that we had the sound problems, which we apologize for. Um, but they occurred literally eight minutes before we went on air and there was just not time to try and figure out what was going on. But I don't think it's detracted from the sense of what Jeff has said. Um, you get used to it after a while and it was absolutely fine. Um, but we'd rather it hadn't been there. I'd also like to thank Steve, Steve Roud, Elaine Bradkey and Sean Graber, who've been quietly monitoring the chat in the background, transferring information as necessary. Um, so they can have a well-earned drink as well. Mm. And even though in a sense, I'm partly thanking myself, thank you to the traditional song forum for hosting the Roy Palmer lecture again. Um, the next TSF online meeting is in two weeks time on the 13th of December. Um, Steve and I have been cooking up a seasonal special um, with all sorts of seasonal goodies to stuff in your seasonal Santa sacks. Um, though, unfortunately, you will need to bring your own mince pies. Um, details of that event will be going out to traditional song forum members um, in the middle of the week um, and we'll advertise them more widely um, to the rest of the world shortly after that. So if you want to be absolutely sure of getting a place in the Zoom um, side rather than on the YouTube side, which is fine, but it has its limitations, um, then get in early. And to make sure you get in early, why not join the traditional song forum? You can find out how to do that by going to our website, www.tradsong.org, which could some helpful person just type that into the chat before I finish talking. www.tradsong.org. And on the home page, you'll find a link to a registration form which you send off to Sean and uh, we'll do the rest and we'll send you regular newsletters and news of TSF events and other interesting stuff about traditional song. So thanks again to Jeff and to you all for coming. We'll hope to see you all again soon. I can. Am I still on? You are, yes. I can leave you with a little quote, another from my journal that um, I did a class, it was a second grade, I think you call them year three over in the UK. I, I did a class in Bolivar, Ohio. And at um, the end of the time, I got a note from one of the kids that said, thanks for coming to waste your time with us.
<laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, see you again soon.